Hello everyone, welcome to GoGoBo World. This is a special event. First of all, it's 46 events so far and we are doing this event for, for one year and a half. But today we are partnering again with the Tech Week, New York Tech Week, which you are part of right now and it's been awesome. So during this event, feel free to take screenshots uh, of yourself with, with the judges. Uh, put this on social media with tagging New York Tech Week and Go Global World and yourself and other participants. Let's do some noise uh, on the internet, so making this awesome and viral. Now, uh, uh, we will have uh, a few uh, announcements, uh, rules. Uh, I will also present the judges in a moment and we'll jump right into it. The way we love it, the way we do this GGW Sharks. Now, uh, let's learn uh, what is Gogobo World first and move on. So, Gogobo World, this is the place where we connect founders and investors. Mathematics is deciding who is relevant to who. And the great news is that Gogobo World platform, our startup, was accepted to Berkeley Skydeck. So just shout out for us. And uh, it's because of your love, because of your support, we're moving, progressing. Thank you for that. Now, we have some amazing news uh, sh uh, sh to share that uh, we have some startups being funded after pitching to the uh, on the event or being on our platform. And recently we had some TechCrunch news with an awesome, awesome entrepreneur uh, and uh, who were uh, also like you on similar event and also uh, our ecosystem and he met uh, one of the investors who, who is actually today on the panel the analyst who end up investing in this startup early and it ended up to be a s amazing large deal so we're super excited and uh, this is all, all over in the news right now and second deal we had not too long ago as well uh, from a company who were uh, who registered on the platform struggled to uh, find the right investors and they got matched with the right one and after a little bit of due diligence they got their 500k check so these are just some examples of how it's happening fundraising is hard fundraising is a full-time job we understand we are there to help we have large network of investors to connect you with uh, making this highly curated uh, network but for investors as well these are the most curated most relevant deals we can find based on your very tight criteria how we do this so uh, both investors and startup create their one pager but it's not a static one pager you actually have um, all your key information about you as an investor and apply for funding but so you can share it with everyone who is called out to reach to you and the system will process this automatically giving a decision whether it's a fit or not before you even see this deal for startups you create your uh, uh, beautiful one pagers the system creates these beautiful one pagers once you are uh, um, uh, once you are uh, just, uh, you're creating these beautiful one pagers so, so uh, once you're filling in the form and uh, uh, you put this uh, video pitch and the system is pitching on your behalf 24 7. so that's uh, that's it this is how it's uh, just getting started and uh, then with uh, this is how investors will see very limited information about you on purpose so then in 60 seconds you need to convince them why it was their time or they will pass if they need to see their more, more detail they can click on see full one pager but in here it's always relevant startups for investors so investors are not seeing just random ones only those who are fit and when we say relevant we, ha we have put real complex algorithms to make sure that uh, it's a real fit and we uh, let the uh, system learn from your actions uh, to make this curated deal flow most relevant or uh, deal flow of investors for, towards startups as well so uh, it's uh, relevant investors only for you as well that's it so go on google world create your profiles uh, pick your subscription and start uh, connecting to each other that's it so GGW Sharks is a pitch event uh, that is uh, um, uh, that is partnering right now with New York Tech Week. And it's been a success uh, during the past New York Tech Weeks, uh, and now we have a new panel of investors that I'm excited to announce: Haas from Blue Ventures, Dan Ellis, uh, Angel Investor and Mentor Tech Stars, Carolyn Gash, uh, Managing Director at Irish Angels. Matt Varage uh, invested uh, Cartado Ventures and Austin Reeves Associate and uh, 
uh, uh, at Sintero Ventures. Uh, and now we have investors to present themselves. Let's start with Austin and we go one by one. Austin, tell us about yourself, where you're from and your investment criteria, maybe you invest in this. Yeah, so my name is Austin Reeves. I'm here on behalf of Sentiero Ventures. We're a Dallas-based uh, BC firm, primarily focused in AI, B2B, SaaS companies. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd say that's a pretty narrow. Uh, happy to be here. We are excited to have you. Carolyn, your turn. Hi, Caroline Gash. I'm the managing director of Irish Angels. We are one of the largest, most active angel networks in the country, uh, in the US, we're comprised of University of Notre Dame alum, which is the Irish piece. No requirement to be Irish or to have a connection to the university to pitch to us. We're generalists. Uh, we invest about 10 million a year, primarily in seed stage investing. Fantastic, super excited to have you. Thank you for coming. Matt Waric, your turn. Yeah, hey everybody, Matt Waric here. So I'm part of uh, Cortado Ventures. We're an Oklahoma City-based venture capital firm focusing on early stage companies, uh, primarily B2B uh, companies in the fields of aerospace, energy, life sciences, and future of work. Sounds exciting. Great to have you. Haas, your turn. Hi, I'm Haas. I'm based out of Vancouver in Canada, um, although I spend most of my professional life in, in Texas. Um, as part of my own fund, I'm focused more on the deep tech space, uh, predominantly on the seed stage, but I'm happy to go a little bit plus minus. So from pre-seed to series A, I prefer to have some kind of customer low, uh, but I'm also a venture partner in a different firm. Um, and we are a generalist firm uh, and, and we basically look at everything from bread all the way to space companies. Uh, but again, from pre-seed to series A. Thank you. Sounds exciting. Thank you for being with us uh, and looking forward to see what you have to say as well. So then, Alice, uh, no pressure, but you're opening our global session of New York Tech Week, as usually we do with every uh, judge who is uh, the fifth uh, to present themselves. So <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, tell us yeah, about uh, yourself, the investments in this. Yeah, great. Yeah. Hey, Danil, uh, thanks. Uh, great to be here as always. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Dan Ellis here in Austin, Texas. I have 10 years experience as an angel investor, and I currently represent the investing interests of a family office called Sure Ventures. Uh, we're typically doing checks in the range of 50 to 100K. I would say we are mostly sector agnostic. Uh, we're just looking for amazing founders that are working on super interesting products with signs of traction and growth. Man, excited to hear the pitches today. Thanks. Sounds exciting. We have a lot of amazing. Hopefully, uh, you find one today as well. So this is the moment we get started. I'm kicking myself from the stage. And uh, the next, the first founder to present is uh yulia pioneer ip yulia are you ready of course hi okay. hi everyone great to have you so you got mine um likewise uh you got disappeared can you, what's happened i don't know i'm here can you hear me we can yep. hear you oh, yeah, <laughs> so just be close to the camera so you got two minutes and you may start now okay fantastic so hello everyone i believe many of you as entrepreneurs have patents but did you know that your patent can uh, can actually be easily infringed and you will not even know about that cases like samsung's one billion payout to apple highlight this type of cases at pioneer ip we have a solution an ai powered automation of patent infringement search you give us the patent number, we'll give you the list of product web pages that can potentially infringe on your patent. You can negotiate the license opportunity and create the new revenue stream for your business. I'm Yule, again, CEO and co-founder of Pioneer IP. Previously, I co-founded a drone company, raised $7 million and expanded sales globally from Japan, Australia, Middle East, Africa, and the US. Now we target the 50 billion industry with Pioneer IP. Our subscription business model aims to generate over $100 million in revenue in year five, serving patent holders, patent attorneys, and investors. In just a few months, we have developed the up and running POC. We're accepted by the local Toronto Accelerator, greetings from Canada, uh, collected interest from investors and um, in the US and Canada and plan to launch uh, MVP and sales in August. Our diverse team combines the experts uh, in uh, patents, a serial software entrepreneur with a successful exit, second time founder, and AI and uh, machine learning specialist. So we, on our end, we understand the pain points, we know uh, how to address them, and we know how to grow businesses. 
We plan to start raising money soon. Uh, it will be around $1 million to transit from POC to MVP and launch sales. So happy to, to stay in touch, happy to answer questions, and please join Pioneer IP. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time. Sounds exciting. And uh, dear Sharks, what do you think about, about this project? you have any questions? Yulia, who would be your ideal customer profile for this? Right. Um, I would say that the patent attorneys who protect their and serve the patent owners uh, for their needs and the patent owners as well. Okay. Do you have any customers right now in beta? We have beta testers. We do not sell yet, uh, but probably actually we might have the first sales deal this month, uh, the law firm from Ottawa. What do your uh, use of funds look like with that million dollars? Right, mostly the salaries to hire more machine learning engineers, the uh, most of the, uh, the the team, and then just to launch the sales, and that's it. Okay. Are you planning to hire most of your engineers in-house? Correct. Okay. Julia, how do, how do these pattern attorneys, how do they work right now, and how much time does it take, and eventually with your product, how much time do you actually save them? Like, what's the... What's the value for you? Great question. Thank you so much for this. So uh, actually, there are two ways how the companies and patent attorneys can solve this problem now. First, it's like manually traveling from one trade show to another trade show, collecting the uh, prospects and leaflets of the products, get back to office, sit down with your patent agent, look through, and trying to identify who might infringe on your patents. So it doesn't sound good in 21st century. The other, the other way is to go to some law firms who do the search for you simply in Google. Um, they just use the keywords, trying to identify who are those who might infringe your patents. It costs a fortune. So we offer this 30 times more affordable than this type of services by some firms. So that's the value. So they cut the expenses and time. Yeah. So um, I don't know how many lawyers actually go and travel around. I mean, that's just a, a very expensive. Patent owners. Patent owners right. travel. Right. And most you do online search and the patent office search that can give you a result. But even when you, so what's your end result? Like you just tell them how many companies are in the similar product or similar market and maybe infringing on your patent or how deep do you go into the technical analysis of the patent? Because that's where even lawyers cannot agree on who's right and who's wrong and that's how it leads to the courts so what's the value add beyond just right. searching for the name correct so um based on our ai engine it's trained the way that it prioritizes the uh, results so that you can look through them and also give us your user feedback so that the algorithm understands what is the best let's say best uh, infringer for you to, to outreach and say hey guy you infringe our patents let's let's talk or go to court there are mostly two options and um so on the first stage we do just the search then on the next stage what will happen is we will upload the business analytics as well so that you can be more informed about the potential infringers for instance, if it makes sense to go after some small firm that like costs zero and probably doesn't bring you a lot of results and our business opportunities, whereas if that's the more mature company, you can create business together and create the new revenue stream for a business as the license, for example. So that's that's how it works with the uh, with our AI engine and the trained engine. The last question, and I'll, I'll go quiet, but. What is your specific products mode? Like if it's just an AI engine and it's just searching online and you know putting outputting the results, what gives you this long-term sustainable advantage compared to right. 10 other companies working on the patent to AI? Great question. All the companies you probably heard about, like PatSnap, the giant, um, uh, Annal Patents, a very famous company here in Canada and others, they search inside patent domain. So they analyze the patent database, and then they have the different features. So that's how that's how they differ uh, differ from from each other. Whereas we search outside patent domain, we search on internet, right? So that's the patent infringement search. Like um, 
It's not the validity. It's not patentability. That's the last stage of the life cycle of a patent. That is not atma. Uh, that doesn't have any automation still. Okay. So uh, this is the moment where uh, maybe one final question for any from from the sharks. Anyone else? Okay. Then I have a, a question to all of you. Uh, who is in? Who is out? If you're out, please give short feedback. Uh, uh, if if you're in, just uh, let me know. So, is there any sharks interested to connect with Julia? I'll be interested. I'll I'll connect. I want to learn the, more about the competitive landscape. Sounds exciting. Uh, congrats! One shark is in. Fantastic. Uh, what about the rest? I'm out. This uh, sort of sounds like it would perpetuate the patent troll businesses. I'm not a big supporter of that space, so I think for that reason, I'm going to set this one out. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm out as well. Oh. You guys go ahead. Carly. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm out as well. I've got some legal tech experience and investments uh, and learned that it was very challenging to sell into law firms there. And I hope there are no lawyers on this call. Um, but they're very challenging customers with sales cycle and paying their bills, and they tend to be digital laggards. So um, thank you for pitching, but I'm out. Thanks. Yeah, similar to Caroline's point, I think the uh, the legal uh, the legal space is a bit too hard to penetrate in that sense. And also, it's, it's really just we're in a position of a AI arms race, so things are just moving way too fast right now. And, um, you know, something viable today might not be as, as uh, productive tomorrow. Awesome. And awesome. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's, I, I like the idea. It's a little bit too early stage for us. Uh, so for that reason, I'm out, but, but best of luck. And it was, I, it was a pleasure listening. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Yule, this is your feedback. Please share your GGW profile here in the chat, support others, and we are moving on. Thank you for your presentation. And the next, the next person to present is Anishit. Uh, 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 let, uh, let me locate Anishit, you here? Can, can you hear me? I'm here, Daniel. Can you hear me? Let me find. I found you. Okay. So, Nishit, you got two minutes. Uh, please uh, start now. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I, I apologize for the background noise. I'm actually at an event representing the product. So, I, I apologize if there is a background noise. So, you know, we have all seen family and friends suffer from joint pain, a chronic arthritis, or some type of sports injury. 60 million people in the US alone suffer from uh, joint pains, and that number is 500 million worldwide. I'm here to tell you that my company and products are relieving joint pain arthritis without any surgery, without any painkillers. Uh, and that's just one aspect of what we treat with our products. So hello, everybody. My name is Nishit Pancholi. I'm the co-founder of Joint Tech Labs, a pioneer in the field of regenerative medicine. We are a revenue producing company with an FDA cleared uh, product device on the market and a European CE mark uh, accrued medical device on the market. Our devices isolate and uh, deliver stem cells uh, from your own body, helping to heal and regenerate without any side effects, without any surgery, and more importantly, at the point of care. Our markets in the orthopedics, sports injury, aesthetic, and plastic surgery verticals have a huge time of $160 billion. Now, Joint Tech Labs has achieved significant milestones and traction, including, as I mentioned, FDA clearance, CE mark approval in Europe, a growing revenue, IP ownership with more than 14 patents granted, distributor contracts, ex licensing, uh, ex US licensing deals, and experienced industry known professionals heading the company with deemed domain expertise. Together, we are creating a unique ecosystem of regenerative medicine products, which establishes a standard of care. We are raising our pre series A of uh, 1.5 million to scale US operations and launch in the ex US markets. And we are using AI as a tool for data collection. Looking forward to talking to you more about joint labs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please keep yourself muted while you're not talking. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, let's hear what digital sharks uh, would say. Yeah, sharks, do you have any questions? Would like to start. Austin would like to start. Um, yeah, so just to give you an early answer, we, we're not in the hardware, so um, unfortunately I'm out, but um, I think it's a very interesting idea and, and like to hear what you're doing. Um, so yeah, but I'd like to continue the conversation and hear anyone else's feedback. Thank you. One shark is out, so let's see what the rest of the sharks. Nishit, you said that you guys have already achieved FDA clearance, correct? 
uh, sorry, can you repeat that? So you, uh, Joint Tech Labs has already uh, achieved FDA clearance? Yes, we already have FDA clearance, clearance and we are on the market since about a year and a half. Okay, and how much uh, how much money have you guys uh, generated today? Uh, so in 23, we did a uh, little bit north of half a million in revenue. And this year we'll touch about, uh, we'll grow about 200% or so about one to 1 1.2 million in revenue. Okay, and you guys are, uh, B2B or are you guys doing B2C? Yes, it's a B2B model. We cater directly to orthopedic surgeons, uh, physician practices, pain management physicians, aesthetic and plastic surgery practices. Okay, and where are you guys based out of? Uh, the company is headquartered in uh, Florida, Tampa, Florida, and we have a sub office in uh, the Bay Area. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, what are you right. doing? What are the uses of the the one point five? I'm surprised that it's such a small number. Yeah, so basically, you know, we have kind of developed uh, the sale, you know, uh, shortened the sales cycle. Now we know exactly what the CAC is. Uh, we need the money to scale up in the U.S. market because a bulk load of the work in the ex-U.S. markets are done by distributors. Uh, so basically, we're looking for bulk of the money going into uh, the you know uh, upping the sales cycle. I mean, sorry, uh, the you know, reducing the sales cycle and upping and scaling within the U.S. market uh, to reach our Series A goal within the next 12 months, 12 to 18 months, I would say. And where, what's your ultimate exit uh, plan for the company? So, you know, we have had very, very early conversations with a few med techs like, you know, Arthrex, uh, Striker, and so on. So they are watching the field very intuitively because, you know, it is eventually eating up into their, their profit margins into the surgical tools that they apply for, you know, similar indications. So I think three to five years down the line, um, they, they, you know, in the, in the interim, there will be potential licensing opportunities in certain geographies and, and ending up in a potential M&A uh, by one of these major metrics. And just to let you know, you know, to answer a question on why so little, everything that you heard from me, we have done it in the 2.2 million that we've raised so far. So we've been very, very capital efficient in that sense, you know, having a product FDA cleared, C mark clear, which is a big deal and launching in Europe. And of course, having a market already in the, in the US. And when did you found the company? So over what time period? The company was originally founded uh, as, a, as a different project in 2009. That's why you, you see the name labs in it, because we were trying to, you know, and I wasn't involved right from the start. So my partner, Nathan, uh, he was involved in kind of a servicing lab for stem cell industry at the start. But then we pivoted uh, sometime in 2015, 2016 to kind of conceptualize the device, went through prototyping and then uh, got our clearance thereafter. So I would really say the phase two of the company, which is in the current shape today after the pivot started right around 2016. Hey, uh, sure. how like I might have go ahead. I might have missed, but could you explain like in, without going too technical in depth and everything? But let's give an example of let's just say a knee that is suffering from the arthritis pain and whatnot. Yeah. What does the device actually do, and how does it work? Absolutely. So you know the device uses the concept of adipose or fat derived stem cells. So it's a known field, uh, a known uh, thing in the industry for the past twenty years. Ever since those stem cells were isolated, uh, our device kind of helps it to bring it down to the level of the clinic in a closed loop fashion, where you no longer need some sort of an operating room or a lab to process such cells. So first of all, it opens up many more horizons for the physician practices. So the patient with walks in typically. But they take a little bit of lipoaspirate uh, using, you know, part of the kit that we already have within the kit. Uh, and then it gets processed within the device in the next 25 minutes. And then the final product, which is the microfat or the stem cells, get reinjected back into the knee or wherever it's needed. Uh, so the, the way it helps is because these stem cells have property of multiplication, first of all. It helps with a lot of pain relief, uh, anti-inflammatory effect. There's a lot of growth factors within these cells that they release. And an and, 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 uh, enhanced effect of recruiting more stem cells to the area, uh, re, uh, you know, reducing the recovery time or altogether, you know, having them not do get into any surgical processes in the future. And we have data collected for about, I would say, the last two and a half, three years on various indications, including arthritis, including rotator cuff tears. And there is, even after three years, about two and a half, three years of data collection, the the pain scores are at about uh, less than 40% of what they used to, uh, you know, ha have. 
uh, before before the treatments. So is this a one-time treatment or you have to do it like yes. every three months or something? No, it's a one-time treatment. Uh, so far, you know, none of the patients have required uh, a second dose. Okay. So, um, oh, sorry, Haas, were you done? No, go ahead. Look, maybe we have oh, one, um, one more question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, so, correct me if I'm wrong. I know that, uh, you know, certain NBA players, like I know LeBron James, he goes overseas um, to, to uh, I believe it's Switzerland, to get this procedure. I know that there's some uh, red tape around uh, the process in the United States. So with that being said, what does your competitive market look like if, you know, these, these guys overseas already have established this large client base and, uh, you know, they're, they're probably well on their way and, and, and penetrating the market. Right. So in terms of direct competition, we have one, you know, uh, device that was launched about three years back, a very, very manual device. We have a lot of, you know, benefits over that device. So in terms of direct competition in the adipose, uh, stem cell microfat space. We just have one direct competition. Of course, as you mentioned, you know there's certain other products which are blood derived products. They something called as PRP, which uh, you know might have heard with a lot of athletes or with Kim Kardashian and so on, especially on the aesthetic side as well. It is not really a stem cell therapy treatment. It is a uh, you know a blood derived product which was kind of in lieu of while none of the products were hitting the market. Uh, it took a lot of market for that reason, but it's it's kind of still in the gray zone in regards to efficacy for a lot of these, you know, sports medicine come aesthetic plastic surgery applications. So I think adipose, which is, you know, science behind it, uh, I think, you know, it will, you know, kind of gradually come overcome uh, that resistance in terms of the usage of blood derived, uh, similar blood derived products. Actually, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have no more questions. Uh, send the, the question I have to the sharks. Who is in? Who is out? Is there any sharks interested to connect with Nishit? We'll be out here uh, just because we're not medical device investors. Sure. Okay. Two sharks are out. Austin and Dan. Uh, Carolyn. Yeah, I'm. I'm out. I actually think you're doing some really interesting things, but med device. While I do it occasionally, isn't my specialty, and I think it needs a specialist, and you would be better served with a specialist. But I think you're doing some interesting things. I'm glad to have learned about it. Thank you. Thank you. So we have two sharks left, Matt and Haas. Let's see, let's see what they say. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we do specialize with uh, in, in life sciences as well as uh, uh, heart tech. So I would be interested to to hear more about it. Sure. Awesome. We have one shark as in. Congratulations. We'll do the introduction afterwards, probably tomorrow. Haas, what about you? Um, no, I, I initially, it's a, it's a good product, obviously, and, and um, kudos. You guys have been working on it for a while, and you have changed directions, so you've learned the lessons, and a lot of things are forming a positive direction. It seems like that. You have revenues. But it just, um, I think the speed to the market and the overall market opportunity is sort of, that makes me a bit hesitant. So I'm going to be out on this one. But thank you for for the answers. Thank you very much, Nishit. Uh, this is uh, your feedback. Uh, we'll connect you with Matt uh, probably tomorrow uh, on Monday. Uh, and yeah, good luck with uh, with the event, uh, the other one that you are on. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we are moving on. And the next pr person to present is Jay Shah. Jay, are you here? Oh hi there! Yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, um, I, I um, asked to, to postpone for another fortnight, as um, I'm not very well. Uh, um, you're not, you 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 want to postpone? You don't want to fish, am I right? Yeah, no, no. Yes, I think Jamie, my co-founder, emailed you chaps, but um, okay, I want to be on the best form. I've got to. I've it's got, okay. Um, if you if you cannot pitch, that's okay. That's okay. We'll just let the, the other person to pitch. Just feel better. It's lovely to, to meet everyone and all your investors as well. A lovely group. Um, Thank so you. I've really enjoyed watching the pitches so far, and I wish everyone the very okay. best. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. You feel better and uh, stay in touch. Uh, absolutely understand. Appreciate that. Uh, the next person to present is Siesta Schalpe from V Times. Siesta, you here? Siesta, please turn your uh, microphone on. Yes, I'm here. All right. Can you so, hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. We can see you. Uh, you got two minutes. See my rock. 
Okay, hello. Uh, good evening uh, from Belgium. Uh, I'm here to, pre uh, to present VTime. Uh, it's, a river, it's a new AI created from the ground up based on TensorFlow, and it's specially created for uh, travel. So it's no LLM. It's really only niche and no narrow AI for travel. And what do we do? We actually created an AI who is helping you plan your trip, not in the way uh, ChatGPT or Gemini does, but actually go much deeper. We try to understand the traveler. We try to keep in mind their budget, things to do, hotel, restaurants, and we tie it all together so you have the most fantastic trip that's possible in the city. So uh, where are we on the moment? We actually partnered up with uh, Vodafone. Uh, it's a telecom operator in the Netherlands. Uh, we partnered up with Package Ship to make a first product for hotels, where we actually deliver, deliver our system into the rooms of the hotels, so hotels can offer a trip planning in, to their customers when they arrive at the hotel, because more than 65% of the people who are arriving at the hotel actually did not plan anything in beforehand, before they, before they travel. So that's part one. Second part, we are actually in alignment with several um, air, air, uh, air, how do you say it in English? Uh, <laughs> um, airplane offers no uh, airlines, yeah, airlines uh, companies who really are interested in to offer the product to their customers on, on the airplane or before when they do the tripping uh, or planning the trip, uh, actually to support them better, to have a better conversion rate and to optimize uh, the experience for the for the customers. And last, uh, we are actually just started our fund round two weeks ago in um, San Francisco. Uh, and we are looking for a seed round of 1.5, actually to roll out faster to the hotels. We have a plan of 29 cities. Uh, we have more than 30 hotels ready to uh, attach to our system. So yeah, there are we are at the moment. and. Thank That's you. Time. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so, dear sharks, uh, siesta from Belgium. Uh, the, the raising seed round. What do you have any questions? To what extent is the uh, product uh, built? Excuse me, Dan. Uh, yeah, how far along are you with the product? Is this live? Like, can I actually go yeah. use this right now? Well, actually, in the teaching hotel, it's live. Uh, it's teaching hotel is in Maastricht in, in Holland. If you fly to Holland, you can go into the hotel and you can uh, use the product. Um, so we are now actually preparing the rollout for Amsterdam, then Rotterdam, and so on for Europe. And we are also preparing for uh, checking in in America for uh, the region of Orlando. And sorry, what is the implementation exactly? Is this offered through like a kiosk or like a the? No, it's like actually on the TV. Uh, okay. The partnership we have with uh, with Package Ship is actually a, a provider for uh, in-room services on the TV, and right. we partnered up with them. They get the tool on the TV, and in the tool we are included as the main product actually for the hotels. So I know those TV apps can sort of be a unpleasant user experience. It's kind of clunky to get around and navigate. It doesn't really have the free formness of a, say, phone app. Like punching things into a virtual keyboard is a very like time-consuming process. Like, how does it actually implement it? Like, and in what respect is it using AI? Um, the aspect of you, first the UI. Uh, well, actually, my background is uh, online marketing and development, so that that was a, an advantage in this in this way. We tried to create it as simple as possible. It's not elaborated like the online version that we have. It's actually uh, selecting the fields you want to select. You we limited the selection options also per hotel based on what they want, and the action the the, the calculations uh, happen after you give in the information. And then actually, it makes the plan for you. So it, the AI is after the search bar, and we don't use any keyboards or anything. It's really up, down, left, right, and that's the only handling you need to know. If you can handle Netflix, you can handle our app on on the TV. Um, and your second question was, my excuses. No, I think that I think that covers it. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah. No Thank you. Any more questions? Um. What would you say is your your mode? You know, what's to stop someone else from just 
getting public data and and you know creating a, a travel plan of sorts what what makes you unique in this in this space well actually i started just uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, covid uh, because i realized people wanted to have some personalized trip planning uh, when covid was over and our mode is actually we built the ai ourselves we don't need any a api from chat gpt gemini or anything it's really built on on plans that are created on the first first per, per, uh, version of, of our of our plan or our, our trip planning and we train the ai ourselves so it's really embedded in in our own and to achieve that i know for sure uh, a trip advisor really would love it to to do it but even they uh chose the easy part to have llm so we have an advantage of more than a year on on the rest because we really went only for the AI for travel. So, okay. Yeah. And then next one is uh, the kind of current traction. Where, where are you at now? You know, is it probably, and I might've missed this and I apologize if I did, but it is, are you revenue producing? Is the product ready? Where, where are we at? I know you mentioned you had some hotels lined up, but can you speak to a little bit about your current traction? Well, actually we, we are, <laughs> we, we are just before we launch in the hotels uh, because every hotel takes its own screens. Um, and we hope to launch in September. So we hope to be live in the in the first hotels in Amsterdam in September and to launch it in, in one time. We had a soft launch last year for the teaching hotel together with Vodafone. Um, and we had a full test phase. So we had the learnings to know how to adapt. We do still do the adaptation of all the learnings now and then we launch so that we have a full optimized product in, in the market. Okay. So just so I'm understanding this correctly, the user has to physically be in the space or in the hotel lobby to utilize the product? Is that correct? Actually in the, uh, for the hotels, actually in the room. So the plan the is, so, yeah, so it's really in the room. They are in private, they, they can do whatever they want. If the hotel wants an iPad, it's perfectly possible. Um, we have an online version, but we have to rework it uh, after the learnings we had. And because our, we are bootstrapped, we didn't have any funding around beforehand. We invested all ourselves. Uh, we had to choose the hotel direction that could deliver fast revenue or a B2C where we have the competition of all the LLM plans who are there for the moment and cost us a lot of money CPC-wise and Google Ad-wise to, to attract uh, clients and users. Uh, so we went for the hotel part. So the development of the B2C part we put behind for the moment. All right. No more questions, right? Are there any? OK, so the, uh, Austin, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh... Matt, Matt hit on a good point. I just, you know, if you're if you're marketing to these hotels, are they expected to like, let's say they're completely on board with what you're doing? Are they going to have to acquire the the devices to use your service, or is it going to be how how does that work? Is it are you are you in the hardware space? No, we don't. We are not in the hardware space. Um, actually, uh, hotel room uh, or hospitality TVs has a, have actually the software present to take the software on the TV from a distance and one hotel is like a half a day work to install everything on the TVs. And that's oh, all. And it's actually, we don't have to do it. It's actually Package who is doing the software installs. So okay. That's either cost that's not, that's not associated with that. Okay. And the question is uh, to the Sharks, who is interested to connect uh, with, uh, with Siesta, the time team? Um, I'd be interested to learn more about kind of the go-to-market strategy and, and where you fit. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to connect. Awesome. Mashak is in. Congratulations. Uh, so we're, we have four left. Uh, and interesting for what they say. I'm going to be out on this one. I'm just like highly skeptical of like homespun AIs. I just feel like it's impossible to compete with the chat GPTs and clothes of the world. And, oh. and I, I just can't hey, believe I saw the user experience. We'll be able to like take advantage of AI over a TV interface versus say an app on your phone. So I'm just, I'm not sure I'm getting the product, but yeah, I'm going to pass. Thank you. One shark is out. Caroline. Uh, yeah, I'm out as well. It's a tiny bit early for me. I've looked at similar tech, so I think it's a little crowded, but uh, congratulations on bootstrapping this far. Thank you. Two sharks are out and we have two left, Matt and Haas. 
Yeah, I think uh, I'm going to have to pass on this one as well. I think that the space is far too competitive and uh, I, I like to make like make decisions based on what I've seen and what I know. And, you know, especially with TikTok out there and, and, and YouTube and, and all the like everything in the palm of your hand, I think the market is uh, far too competitive. But, you know, with that being said, I do hope that the next time I check into a hotel, I see uh, your product on the TV screen. Thank you. That was fantastic. Cass? I'm going to be out as well. CSA, I think it's just a, like everyone else mentioned, it's an overly crowded market. I mean, you can just Google search and 25 websites come up and they give you the same answers just in a different format. Instagram has basically taken the charm out of life because everything you want to travel to and see, you can already find. So I don't know how you're going to create value for a customer that they cannot get just based on, you know, five minutes of internet search. But good luck with that. Thank you. Fantastic. This is your feedback. Share your GTW profile and we move on. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. The next one is Dmitry Fedotov. Dmitry, you ready? Hello? Uh, put your mic on. You mute it. Hi, everyone. Sorry. You got two minutes and you may start now. Great. Uh, what's the most precious resource in the world that we cannot replace or reproduce? That's obviously our time. Every single day we have only 24 hours to spend in the market. Uh, Dimitri, sorry, I have to stop you and uh, ask you to restart because you closed your microphone, so you, like, we barely hear you. So probably put your... Yes. Can, you, can you say something? Sorry. Yeah. And uh, as, as a learning for the event, uh, those who are using headphones or especially uh, Apple uh, AirPods, it's usually bad sound, so uh, just don't use them. All right, Dmitry, let's do it again. Okay, good. What's the most precious resource in the world that we cannot replace or reproduce? Obviously, it's our time. Every single day, we have only 24 hours to spend in the most efficient way to make our lives better. If we can cut six hours for sleep, food and other necess necessities uh, that leave us around 13 hours maximum. Let's ask ourselves if we use those hours in a truly efficient way. Based on our feelings and emotions, probably a majority of you say everything is fine. But what's about reality? Statistics say that none, 9 of 10 people will never achieve their New Year goals. 8 of 10 will prioritize work over raising their kids for few or future generations. And today, you will only complete four tasks out of 10 in your to-do list. So what we are doing, Planima is a mobile AI life manager. We'll help you to set up bigger and smaller goals, habits, work projects, and decompose all this project and tasks to the one byte things that you can accomplish in literally one hour. And also, AI makes sure that you progress both on work, on personal and family goals in one single app. So we help you to execute your life at your best every single day. We not only help you to organize your day, but also learn, AI learn and adapts to your unique needs, ensuring that you make the most of every moment. And all this in your mobile app, both for iOS and Android, of course. So in addition, Planima provides you a personalized recommendation, automate your routine tasks, help you to stay focused and on what truly matters. From planning university to your kids, to home renovation, to getting back into shape, drink water, with support of the full power of chat GPT, specially trained on our real cases and user scenario to have a perfect fit for each person. Right now, we are raising 3 million and already have a commitment from 8 billion corporate to use our product when it's ready, like commercial ready. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Yes, Alex. What do you think of this project? Anyone? What, what's the current status of the product now? Is it built? Are there users? Are you generating revenue? Uh, we have more than 1,000 people on a waiting list. We have full design uh, tested. We have a proven AI models that we are using every single day. And right now we are raising money to actually execute it as a commercial product, not as a 
3P MVP that will be hard to sell. I appreciate and I can appreciate and sort of understand the value creation for larger teams with task managers and things like that, just to keep everyone on the same plane. But on an individual level, I think all the reasons you mentioned, people don't complete the task and then they get you know sidetracked and all the reasons they don't drink water and whatnot. I think there's the task manager is not the problem. It's just an in you know inner um, drive or whatever that is, and a lot of external factors. So. I'm not really sure I understand the value creation and how is it going to help me with anything in completing the task? I can just take notes on Excel or WordPad. How do you compare to a, a usual method that I still use, in fact, on a piece of paper most of the times? Uh, yeah, uh, I know this problem. I used piece of paper for the last 15 years before actually starting to work on this app. So the main thing here is to combine in one single app your task manager and calendar so for next 24 hours all your time actually fully planned so you know what you're going to achieve you have a balance you know what work tasks will be there what family tasks will be there what your personal tasks will be there and you have time for all of this without competing with each other excel ca cannot do this to you neither calendar do yeah so I, I think you're you're filling a product that's kind of like a motion calendar and, and i understand the space but i think your um examples that you're using here are a little bit too broad and abstract you're kind of professing to be sort of this all-in-one app that slices dices cuts and cooks uh and i really think you maybe should focus down on a particular use case and market because it's just from a perspective of an app it just seems too broad and so I don't know how you end up marketing it and you know it's just uh how are you going to reach the audience there's so many apps that are like this uh so many AI assistants out there I just feel like you'll just get drowned out with the noise unless you have a specific use case that you're serving we do have we do have our beach head so right now it's 25 to 35 years old busy professionals uh, either top managers or entrepreneurs living in the big cities and who has actually kids they have the biggest problems and we know how to target them and actually I'm the father really understand what they need I still think that's too big a market just for what it's worth um like that would be an aspirational size market like you just described one quarter of the United States like I think you would have to really focus down on like how you're going to reach that audience and I would speak like drill down even further and just say entrepreneurs because then at least you know how to reach that audience you could go to entrepreneurial communities you can market that you can have specific use cases and success stories that you can talk about otherwise it's just too broad I can argue on this but let's save time I I understand what you're talking about but we have all of our calculation and it's really narrowed down so at what point does the application become counterproductive? So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, the website here where it's listing up features, craft your daily routine in seconds, auto rescheduling based on priorities. So if you've, if you've you know, quote unquote, had a hiccup in your day, does that mean you're going to stop everything? You're going to look down at your phone and say, oh, I forgot to drink water. And then it's going to kind of reschedule things or you're going to have to keep adding things. I'm like, I'm still unsure whether this is, you know, you're saying that you want to commercialize this to the extent that is this going to be working with teams or is this for your personal life um I don't know I consider myself pretty type a and pretty organized but I mean if you're I, I honestly don't know how to like I, I can't wrap my head around uh how this might be fully useful um you know outside of an app like Dan mentioned like motion okay number one first um it's automatically uh, schedule your day with understanding of the weather and if for example something changed it will reschedule everything it also will remind you if you will not close really important or urgent tasks and we will we will move it to another day or another week when you have a free time slot um, and literally you just have everything on a one uh, calendar page so it's easy to cancel or to move or reschedule. It's adaptive. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, I guess we're done with the questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, so there is some noise happening. Everyone, please keep yourself muted. I don't know. Okay. So, dear Sharks, do you have uh, anyone interested to connect with Mitri? Or if not, uh, just uh, you may throw some feedback quickly. I think it has potential, but uh, yeah, my just like really quick feedback, just to build on kind of the comments that I already said. There's a lot of competitors in this space already. Like Motion is very established, and there's an easily ten competitors right there in that space alone. So I think like focusing down on a particular niche um, and like niching down even further, it's serving just a very small segment of the market would be your best go to market strategy. Otherwise, I just think you're competing with them right now, and that is going to be a really tough hill to climb. So that would be my feedback. Okay, um, thank you. This... Uh, it's just it just feedback. Uh... Um, thank you. Uh, who else? Austin? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, Dan's comment about market sizes is, is definitely, I, I would agree with him. And then also, you know, I'd be interested to see, I'd, if anything, I'd, I'd want to wait and see how the go-to-market strategy works. Like what's stopping you from being revenue producing now? Um, and and so for, for that reason, I'd probably, I'm, I'm out. Very, very well. Um, anyone else wants to give some feedback to Dmitry? I think I'll just share something. I, I, you know, I've always doubted that, you know, I, I understand democratization of the personal AI for everyone, but I think the true value creation is for of any personal AI or, you know, assistance is for people who are absolutely too busy, whether it's CEOs or, you know, entrepreneurs and sports stars, and they have a lot of things to do. Um, and if you can sort of, if anyone can come up with a product and maybe just, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but instead of in a in a corporate office one person having one assistant if you can make some them more efficient where one assistant actually human assistant can support more than one maybe three or four senior level executives that's where the cost savings could come but overall just monetization at a normal level i just don't see any value creation but i hope you prove me wrong all right thank you uh so i guess uh this is it was extensive feedback uh Dmitry, please share your information here in the chat, support others, and we move on. The next presenter is, thank you, Ben Gottinder from Narrative AI. Uh, ben, you ready? You, you're muted. Please unmute. Now I'm ready. Awesome. Awesome. Good seeing you. Uh, so ready to rock. you got two minutes. All right. So I'm Ben Gottiner. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of Narrative. Narrative is a marketplace for advertisers to license celebrity AI likeness and then use that to generate ads. So I don't know if I need to go into the specifics around this, but um, I'm sure everyone has seen the OpenAI Scarlett Johansson controversy that's come out. So look, that's just the latest in a long line of um, of stories about celebs having their license, their likeness misused. So over the last year, we've seen stories from Tom Hanks, um, Scarlett Johansson, actually, this was her second time, and a few others who have had um, their likeness co-opted without payment. So what we ended up building was a marketplace for um, an advertiser to come in, generate an ad automatically, send it to talent to approve and review, and then assuming that talent has approved it, it can go live into the marketplace. Um, so the other component that I should add on here is um, we've just been approved this month. We're going to be approved by SAG-AFTRA to host their talent on our platform. So we'll be the only entity um, that is able to host celebrity AI talent on a platform and license their likeness. Uh, the only comparable entity here would really be Replica, if you're familiar with them. Um, and their use case is much more associated with voiceover in um, video games. Um, happy to talk more about any specifics here. I also don't want to go over. So let me just pause here for questions. Awesome. Any questions, Sharks? Thanks, Ben. That's uh, interesting. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, how far along are you? Um, do you have any celebrities of significance that we would know that are currently adopting the platform? I would say if you're a football fan, you might know one of the people on the platform. Um, so James Brown, the host of Inside the NFL and NFL Today, is one of the people who um, helped us launch the platform. Um, but look, the, the key concern with building the talent side of the ecosystem here um, that they have is having their likeness co-opted without payment, right? 
So, and one of the main points of feedback that we heard when we reached out to them specifically was, look, you need to become a SAG signatory in order for me to consider joining the platform, because otherwise I have no way to know if you guys are legitimate or not. Um, and we can kind of prove this. We we reached out to um, over 100 people on Cameo back in mid-2023 before the SAG after strikes, and we got a 25% cold response rate um, to that outreach. So people were clearly interested in joining. Then after the strikes, it was like 1%. Um, and so part of what we ended up doing as a result was saying, okay, we need to get approved by SAG-AFTRA. Um, let's go and get that done right now. And we believe that we're effectively going to be SAG's answer to how do you ethically use AI for a bunch of the people who they um, who are part of the union. Let's double click on the Scarlett Johansson controversy a little bit. Sure. <laughs> but I'm curious, like, um, what is the, uh, where is that going? Is that going towards litigation? Is there anything that prevents somebody from effectively cloning a voice and using it? Like, can is that something that can, you know, somebody can sue over? Um, and it, if if it's not the case that can be done, I'm not sure you have a defensible platform here. So it is something that can be sued over. Okay. So. Um, so there's a fair amount of precedent here with respect to using likeness and not compensating the talent for that. Um, I think back in like the early 2000s, Sony had this um, ad that they were trying to create with a famous football player, um, football meaning soccer in this case, I think it was Messi. Um, and they tried to um, create basically someone, uh, an ad using someone who looked like him, but wasn't him. And he was able to sue them and actually um, win that case. Specifically, there's also been examples with Dolly Parton and others. So um, misusing someone's likeness for commercial reasons is absolutely a no-go and it's something you can definitely sue over. When it comes to things like, I don't know, creating a video on YouTube using someone's likeness, that is probably much more protected under something like fair use um, or, um, or parody law. But for commercial use cases like generating ads, like, yeah, you need that person signed off. I think it could get tricky though, because like we know Scarlett Johansson, you know, she's extremely well known. So somebody who is more on the tier below that, I feel like with voice, there's just this plausible deniability aspect to it, because it's like, well, it sort of sounds like him, but not exactly. And you know, you could just say, hey, we know we made that voice, and it just happened to sound like them. Um, so I, I think it could be kind of tricky to enforce it. Are you just purely focused on the audio part, or are you also? like going like kind of preempting uh, a time when you know visuals that get created by ai are better as well yeah so we're focused on audio today but we want to build out the platform to be um, one-stop shop for license um licensing likeness in general so that would include image and video um part of the constraint here is getting approved by sag after right so we were able to um work through audio with them because that's an easier use case so in particular, we've basically established pricing minimums now that will be coming out in the next month or so. So $385 for a four-week advertisement is going to be the floor. I was just wondering, so there's just two ways I can see this, right? This one is like I compared to um, the uh, marketing, influencer marketing campaign kind of tools like Isaiah. Let's just say as an example. So what they did is basically they just democratize the influencer marketing. You could go in yeah, as a brand, make relationships, but that's more for like you know hundreds of thousands, millions of influencers. And then the other part of that is just very niche, five hundred to thousand, let's say, celebrities in the market. So are you focused on the very niche market, or are you trying to just democratize everything um, and make this a tool for you know uh, multiple uh, campaigners or influencers and tiny celebrities and whatnot? We're focused on that nichier market. So it's probably not millions. It's probably thousands of people who would be eligible. Um, I mean, the cap here is actually sag after his user base, most likely, which is 160,000 people. That spans across um, multiple domains. So I wouldn't say everyone there will be an actor since they represent um, others are part of the union. But yes, it is thousands of people. So think like B-level, C-level celebrities who you could maybe get a cameo from today. It's basically just saying, look, there's probably a built-in audience who will recognize that person and their voice if they really understand that um, what that person has been a part of. So, like, here's an example. Um, 
Manu Bennett um, is someone who I have in my emails. You might not know him, but he was an actor in Spartacus. He was on a bunch of CW shows. And he's got kind of like this gravelly, distinct voice that if you were to hear it, you'd be like, oh, like I watch shows with him. I recognize who that is. So it's it's based on the idea that there's a built in audience for all of these folks. So and, and so that's where the value is. And I think I like that. And in fact, um, sort of I would support your argument that as a as a brand, as a company, why would I even risk or expose myself to any kind of legal challenges if there's a much easier way? For me to hire some sort of celebrity for voice voiceover or video or whatnot uh so i like that but then the problem comes there's two main questions i think leading from that one is that you know if every celebrity gets to be used by 25 five or 500 different products or campaigns then you start to lose the importance of that right the scarcity of a celebrity actually improves the value of the celebrity whether it's voice or video and the second would be follow-on question would be how big is this overall market like in 10 years how much do you think your revenues could be? Yep. So I, I think per your first point, it depends on the specificity of the ad and where you're trying to actually distribute it. So for instance, if I'm if I'm working with, let's say, the fifth most important guy on the Pacers, right? I could probably uh, deliver that ad somewhere in Indianapolis specifically. And people would know who that person is because you know they're familiar with the Pacers um, or like they're a rabid sports fan or something to that effect. So in that case, that hyper-local targeting doesn't actually affect that person's brand image nationally um, or even regionally. Like, it's super local. And the idea here is for all these folks, there's enough of a audience that is local that you can target to reach the advertising holy grail of right message at the right time, at the right place, to the right person. In terms of the market size here, for, um, for podcast and radio ad creative which is what we're focused on today it's roughly an 11 billion dollar market so 2 billion for podcast advertising and 9 billion in radio one example that comes to mind here is um i don't know if you guys have heard but there was a there was a guy who used uh, ai to generate a, a drake song i think yep. not too long ago and it ended up being extremely popular and that guy I, i'm pretty sure he got screwed over pretty hard for, for using that. Uh, so I think, I think this is a great idea, uh, you know, using a lot of similar concepts to what I've done in the past with my last startup. Um, I think it's a great idea. Um, and, and similar to what Ha said, you know, if there's a, there's an easier way to, to go about getting, uh, getting licensed, then why wouldn't people do it? And I think that that's a very effective strategy of going after those B tier and C tier, similar to Cameo. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's awesome. And, I know Daniel is going to kind of ask uh, us if we're interested. I think I, I would love to follow up. Unfortunately, um, you know, we don't uh, invest in this particular space here, but I think outside of that, I'd love to be as much help as I could. So let's let's take it as a one, one shark is in. So am I right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Congratulations. So one shark is in. So if no more questions, uh, dear sharks, anyone wants to connect with Ben? I will connect as well uh, over here. Uh, yeah, I think you're probably a little bit early, but we're definitely interested in this future forward kind of technology. And I, I mean, I think like conceptually, you have an interesting idea here. I almost think that greater opportunity might be flipping the script a bit and instead uh, having celebrities buy like protection for their likeness. And then you could scan around for who is in violation of that. I think that could be an interesting like alternative or adjacent area that you might be able to expand into but yeah i'd like to connect that'd be great awesome so and uh, so ben uh, so no, you you three sharks are in uh, dan uh, matt and Haas. so congratulations so and we have two sharks left and we'll see if we have a jackpot today caroline <laughs> yeah no you're not going to i'm out i'm skeptical <laughs> of the i'm skeptical of the market size in terms of Sorry, I know this is more feedback, but skeptical in terms of like that actually being the right number or skeptical of the idea within that market? Uh, skeptical of the idea within that market. Fair. Thank you. Thank you. Austin? Um, I'd say I'm in. I, the one question I have is, you know, if you're B2B or B2C, you know, we're, we're a B2B fund. And so, you know, I think you, you are, you're on the edge with going to the BC, like the ad, like solopreneurs is what you call them, or, you know, that does that count as B2B or B2C? So I'd like to connect to kind of learn more about the client profile. Um, but yeah, that, that, 
Back. It's B2B, just to very quickly answer the question. So it's ad agencies are our primary ICP at this point, um, especially if they have in-house creative studios. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Great job. So almost a job. So uh, if, there's, if there's one last thing I could add here too. Um, so I, I think a, a company like CAA would be extremely interested in something like this um, based off some, some work I've done with them in the past with, with my last startup. Um, you know, they want to protect their athletes completely. And I think this is, this is another way that I think they could. I, I've spoken with some folks there, so I'd love to share notes on who would be the right folks to approach from your perspective, Matt. And sure. thank you all for, um, uh, for everyone participating and for connecting after. The CAA does have a venture arm as well. Uh, yep. Ben, just cap. Awesome. Ben, please share your GG double profile here at, uh, connect to my team and we'll connect you with, uh, the sharks, uh, in the nearest time. Bye. Sounds great. Thank you. Have a good Thank good. you all. Thank you. And the next one is Elizabeth Bank. Elizabeth, uh, you ready? Awesome. So looking forward, uh, we barely, can you say something? We barely hear you. Oh, um, oh, how's perfect. this? This is perfect. Yeah. So excited to have you. You got two minutes and looking forward to hear what you got to say. Okay, sounds good. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Pang. I'm the founder of Amaya AI. It's an AI companion that helps you build better real life relationships. Um, so why am I building this? Um, it's my own personal experience. So I had a lot of trouble dating uh, when I first started dating in my early 20s. Um, I didn't have any examples of healthy relationships when I was younger. And in my early life, I focused a lot on my education and also on work. So most recently before this, I was actually a tech investor at an activist hedge fund. So just didn't have a lot of time to kind of develop that side of me. I didn't really have the information and also the training to find the right relationship for me. So why do I think AI can help and why do I think Amaya AI can help? Um, we deliver good relationship advice. So um, we've trained our model on psychology research. Two, um, we're delivering a counterparty that you can actually role play and talk to and also build a relationship with that behaves like a real person. Um, from our user feedback, we consider this to be our secret sauce. So, for example, if a user sort of needs more tough love feedback, if they're saying something inappropriate um, or that would be counterproductive to you know, building a healthy relationship, Amaya responds with healthy boundaries and they provide an empathetic feedback loop. And so we consider ourselves different um, from ChatGPT and also from the AI girlfriend and boyfriend apps that are out there. One, because we're purpose built for relationship training and advice. And also because we focus a lot on building a relationship with the user, um, specifically focused on having um, chat memory, which helps us get to know users over time um, and also helps them feel like we're actually a real presence and especially a very positive presence um, in their life. So um, I've been able to attract a lot of people um, to this platform so far, just from a grassroots perspective. So um, I obviously come from finance, but I have three engineers on the team. Um, two of them are PhD level researchers. Um, we built and trained our model um, over four weeks. Right now we're in a private beta. And um, with limited outreach, we basically got um, about 20 people to use this beta. Um, I would just end by saying, you know, we, should, we think of Amaya as an AI girlfriend that helps you get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Um, thank you. That's my pitch. Um, open to any feedback or comments that you guys might have. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, you probably touch your microphone or something because your uh, sound like goes up and down. So, but just be aware of that. Don't worry. Uh, so, okay. dear Sharks. Let me know if I can clarify anything. Yeah, absolutely. Dear Sharks, this is your time. What's your questions? I'll, I'll start, but with, with skepticism on um, sort of everything in terms of application of AI with relationship and girlfriends, boyfriends, and all those things. Like, you know, I mean, when it's like there's multiple challenges to understanding somebody's personality. I don't know how many dates you go to. It's if there's chemistry that, you know, there, there's, there's an angle to the chemistry with somebody. And if people can't understand people and, you know, you go through the day and the weeks and the months and years, it's tough. It's a hard work to build relationships. And there's so many different challenges. I just, I'm very skeptical about any kind of AI and not just for, you know, the girlfriend model of the relationship and dating, but even people are trying the same thing for psychology as it's like people can use uh, AI as a psychiatrist and in that space as well, you know, sometimes when you're down in life, you just need somebody to push you sometimes you know, just give you a slap that, you know, you're just thinking in a different landscape. And sometimes you need a shoulder to cry on. Different people react differently. Uh, so even the best psychiatrist cannot be actually the 
greatest match for most of the people probably. So I, I think there's a whole level of skepticism. I don't know how you sort of contrast that and what's your response to that? Yeah, um, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're basically saying that different people sort of need different approaches when they have relationship problems. Yeah, so we've thought really deeply um, about that. So we are not trying to address everyone all at once. Um, we're specifically addressing a certain sub subsegment, and I would call that subsegment someone that's already started kind of their um, self reflective journey. So someone who knows that they have certain um, issues um, that they kind of need to talk about. So in our user chats, a lot of it is actually self directed. Um, they don't, you know, Maya doesn't say, you need to be calmer, you, you know, this is what you need. It's more that the users are saying, uh, for example, I'm in this situation. Um, I'm, I think I'm really overthinking my last date because they said X, Y, Z. And what Amaya does is actually ask a series of questions to kind of figure out what really is the problem and just provides a platform for the user to share. And a lot of times just sharing that information allows the user to reflect on what is actually important to them because usually they they know what the issue is a lot of us kind of know what our issues is our issue is on the inside it's just that we sort of need to say it to someone to figure that out now you can ask you know why not ask your therapist why not ask your best friend well your therapist or best friend is not always available for you at like 2 a.m you know when when most of us are kind of having these existential thoughts and the other thing um you know again it's um maybe there's an ethical issue um or maybe i'm thinking wrong and you can correct me but i think loneliness is a huge problem everyone talks about and we can see that people on dinner tables the families don't talk to each other they're just constantly in front of the screens and you know you you uh, going for visual coffee chats as opposed to just meeting people and phone calls have dropped and people can't have conversations especially kids and so there's a whole ethical aspect of it that the I, I believe the society should reduce the impact of these kind of technologies and sort of relationships in society. Um, but this product that you're uh, sort of proposing is actually increasing it. But that's just my feedback on this. Yeah, we're um, we're trying to counter that. That's why we're not building another replica or um, character AI. It's because we don't want people ultimately to be um, a bias boyfriend or girlfriend um, or consider her that it's and that's actually a very big part of our model prompting is um if you try to you know say can you date me or if you ask her something inappropriate like for a sexy image or something um she, she responds pretty firmly no so that, that's a big part of our um kind of ethics um at my AI is, is we don't want people to be forever online for relationships it sounds like it sounds like it's taking one more step closer to uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie Ex Machina, where the guy falls in love with his robot. Um, yeah. But again, yeah. like I, I think that there's there's so many there's so many things outside of um, you know asking a uh, an AI chat to hey like this is how I feel what should I do and I think it brings an internal conflict of you know am like, you know, say someone or say that I were to invest and taking it from a personal perspective. And am I endorsing the fact that, you know, they're helping these individuals pose as someone they're not, and that might lead to issues down the road um, with, with, with them, you know, trying to enter the dating pool. Uh, and again, like, I think that there's there's a lot of competition in this market, too. And I know, um, you know, I'm not too familiar with the Tinders and Bumbles and all these people like that but i think ai is really something that they're trying to put in there and to me it sounds like this this is more of like a dating coach and a dating therapist than it is a, a dating kind of profile correct that's cor that's correct mm -hmm. yeah yeah um yeah I, I, I don't know if this is something i totally agree with how do you how do you approach hallucinations so obviously they're they're answering some really I mean, they're getting deep in these questions. If you're talking about someone's relationship, um, how are you kind of training the model to not give the wrong advice or to like, let's say someone that's, you know, doesn't know boundaries is on the app and he's getting advice from a dating coach and he goes and does something or she goes and does something based off of what your, your assistant said, like, where does it become like a liability concern of, of and how do you, how do you approach that? Yeah. So um, a lot of this actually speaks to our competitive mode. So we've done a lot of work to kind of get the best training data. Um, so right now we're building on ChatGPT. Um, eventually, once we get a lot more user data, uh, we we hope to consider 
switching to kind of our, our own model, but um, I would say that just testing the model, just for example, using it myself, um, as someone who has been through therapy a lot, um, the advice is generally very good. And I, I position this as a, as, um, you know, I think Matt was saying more of like a dating coach slash, you know, kind of friend companion and not a therapist because there's a lot of more liability if you say that you're going to be a therapist or something kind of looking like closer to a medical professional. So I think that's that's part of it. We kind of do our best to have good quality um, content without claiming that we're a medical professional. Two, we thought a lot about, you know, the case of a uh, user who's depressed or if, um, you know, they kind of indicate self-harm, like things like that. Um, we've consulted a lot of psychologists and we have, you know, psychologists on our kind of advisory board that share with us, you know, what are the best practices for responding in those situations? And, and an interesting thing we found is that even for therapists, you know, they kind of protect themselves from liability by, by saying, Hey, like, you know, if you're really in need, you, you need to call like a hospital. And so we talk to the user through their problem, but at the end, you know, we kind of respond the way that is, is sort of like the best practice, which is we really refer users out if they really need it. Um, and then I would say number three, hallucinations about like, um, like user data. So that's something that Replica and Character AI don't do very well. So like they'll say things like, oh, you know, user, do you remember the time we like went to a beach um, together and blah, blah. And a lot of users actually don't like that because they're kind of like, well, we never went to a beach. You're like an AI. Um, so we've done a lot of prompting to make the AI very like human-like, like, and also realistic. Like, it's not going to tell you that you guys did X, Y, Z adventure together. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are probably one final question, if any uh, left uh, uh, for Elizabeth. Anyone? If none, it's okay. Okay. So my question to the sharks, uh, who's interested to connect? Uh, are you guys in or out? Matt? I think uh, I think I'll have to pass on this, although he wish you the best luck. One shark is out. Class? be out as well but good luck elizabeth thanks for the responses yeah thank you and three sharks left any feedback then yeah I'm, I'm i'm out as well i think it's an admirable challenge to tackle but i think behavioral change is almost impossible and trying to do that with some new budding technology adds even more complications so i wish you all the best and hope to uh see it adopted broadly and prove me wrong Thank you. And we have two more. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I think I'm out as well. Uh, best of luck. And and I think you, I, it's an interesting area. And I, yeah, wish you the best of luck in, in future endeavors. Thank you. And then? Uh, Elizabeth, I think it's very interesting. Um, I think there's like a lot of skepticism around AI companionship, but I think it's almost a generational thing because I know like Gen Z, younger people are very interested and open to the idea. Um, and I think like even with respect to like therapists, it's starting to like break through. Uh, a company called Sword Health just this morning raised 130 million at a $3 billion valuation. Uh, and it is going to be using heavy amounts of AI for physical therapy. Um, so I do think uh, there is a, a sea change happening around this area. And I think a dating coach is actually a really good idea. So I definitely like to connect and learn more. Awesome. One shark is in. Congrats. Congratulations. So we'll connect you after the event today to tomorrow, probably. Uh, so good luck, Elizabeth. Please share your GGW profile here. Support others and we're moving on. Okay. Thanks, awesome. Uh, Vipin uh, uh, Mahiria, uh, you're next. Yes, please. Um, Hi from New York. Can you, can you hear me okay? We can hear, but we cannot see you. Can you turn on your camera, please? trying to do that now unfortunately i did all the tech check beforehand but it didn't quite work okay so then uh oh perfect awesome you're here so you got two minutes and you may start now perfect well thank you guys uh my name is vipin makija for 15 years that built products and teams at zero to one mobile startups and one to ten companies that went public i also created a real estate marketing solution company a few years ago I'm now bringing all of that experience together to build Cast, a mobile AI solution that gives real estate agents superpowers to grow their brand and business. Real estate is the largest asset class in the country served by over 2 million agents. This particular opportunity represents a $9 billion TAM. 
we spoke to over 400 agents. Imagine John, an ambitious real estate agent in New York. John's most excited and trained to close deals, buying and selling homes with his clients. But he's unsure and fearful on a daily basis where his next buyer or seller lead will come from. John uses too many disconnected marketing tools. Each comes with a high price point and learning curve, and he doesn't get the consistent results he desires. Enter Cast. In step one, our smartest all-in-one mobile app bundles everything that John needs for marketing and cuts the clutter, workflow clutter of tools and costs by five times on day one. But wait, that is just the start. 80% people work with the first or second agent they meet. This means that John needs to get in front of the leads early to be competitive and stay on top of their mind everywhere. Cast will give agents superpowers by predicting and sourcing buyers, sellers, and investors through proprietary AI-driven intense signals even before they're aware of their intentions and then hyper-personalize all communication so agents like John can focus on closing deals and not chasing leads. We're going to market this month with our private beta. We'll first convert more than 8,000 agents that are part of our Instagram community and work with a strategic channel partner who's an industry leader and international speaker who's followed by more than 100,000 agents. We'll launch and market the current version of the app at $50 a month with the upsell of predictive signals over time. Our team consists of experts, partners, and advisors in data science, mobile tech, and real estate. We believe CAST will become the sidekick that turns agents into superheroes by providing them better leads faster. We're currently raising 300K pre-seed to upgrade and market our commercial private beta product. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Uh, five seconds behind time, but well done. Hold on. Um, dear Sharks, what's your question? How does it predict uh, buyers and sellers exactly? Like I, I'm trying to imagine how that could work. Was that Dan? Yes. Hi. So hi. So the idea is that typically it's a life event of some sort that will drive or prompt the interest in buying, selling, or investing. For example, somebody's getting married, divorced, kids are going to college, they're relocating, they're getting promoted. So life events play a big role. But sometimes it's also how long have you held the property? So research says that eight to nine years is what it takes for people to sell their first home and, and buy another one, slightly bigger one. But we've also discovered through our machine learning algorithms, some things that you would not, you would not predict. For example, if you just put a roof on your home within the next six to nine months, you're more likely to start to think about selling your home. So some are hypotheses that are validated by the algorithms and some the machine spits out. So sure. you use yeah, I can, let me just interject real quick. So yeah, I understand the premise. Like I agree with all of those statements, but like, how do you get that data? How am I going to know that a new roof was put on a house? I'm a real estate agent and I'm, I'm, I don't know, in like North Los Angeles, like how do I know for the market area? Where do you so we, and source that data? So we bought uh, some of, a lot of this data, property ownership, mortgage, tax, neighborhood, et cetera, can actually be sourced from the counties, but there are data aggregators who, whose entire business is to do that. So we procured uh, five zip codes worth of data. So that was about 40,000 houses in California. That's what we trained our models on. Uh, and we also purchased some demographic data. Some of that, again, can be through creative techniques. Uh, LinkedIn is one big one where you can capture some life events, like at least on the professional side. Some of that can be creatively sourced from the internet as well. So we looked at 45, around 40,000 properties in California, five zip codes, uh, procured that data through a partner who's an industry leader really in, in, in property data, um, and then trained our model on that. So in terms of market expansion here, are you gonna continuously have to buy the data in other zip codes and then train the models on that? And then how do you stay up to date? So for example, you know, what if, uh, you know, what if Dan's roof fall? Of course, I hope this doesn't happen. Uh, what if Dan's roof uh, caves in and, um, you know, like that just happens tomorrow. Is that data continually updated or uh, is it under like a contract where it's shared over time? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so the, the data aggregators, they can provide daily APIs for data. It depends on the business model that's set up. They also provide historical data going back four years, five years that you can train the data on, but they have uh, daily. But I think in terms of like structural structural data, I would assume it's you know three to four weeks is when they have their batch files going out. 
So the idea will be, yes, I think over time, the more users use it, uh, the more we explore, the more layers we add um, to, to the data model, it continues to get smarter. And is that, uh, like, is that a high cost to, to uh, the data to share the data? Data acquisition will be, I think, costly, of course, um, but it depends on how it's rolled out. I, like I said, I also ran a marketing solutions agency, so I know that brokers and agents are willing to pay premium for even one single lead that works out for them, um, especially in New York where I live, but California, which is where we tested the model. Uh, I think median price is around 800, 900,000. So they're willing to pay premium uh, for the data. So I think depending on how the model is structured, um, the, the, you, you can compensate um, the, the, the agents accordingly. So is this, is this more, it seems like it's more B2C, like these agents are, are like the, the customers and not, not as much as, as a B2B product. Is that correct? To be honest, I call it B2P. Um, I ran, I was chief product officer at a mobile tech company and, you know, I, I ran countrywide research on solopreneurs or small businesses. So they typically operate as solopreneurs or in small teams, but they're all associated with a larger brokerage under under whose umbrella they operate. I am obsessed with uh, customer delight. So I want to make sure that the end agents are most successful. But I think over time, I definitely want to strike some business deals with higher level brokerages. This is where our strategic channel partner, who is more likely to become a co-founder as well, um, he's, he's very well connected with the CEOs of two of the largest brokerages in the com in the in the country and they've expressed willingness to explore new tools uh, that can help them you know get to the next level it is the traditional um, market so I think any sort of innovative disruption um, is is certainly uh, is certainly that brokerages want to embrace with open arms so you the, the goal is to start with the real estate agents and then try to go to the larger agencies is that is that that is that is my goal and that's how I'm wired I want the underlying customer to be absolutely obsessed and delighted with the product. And then I think brokerages will hopefully uh, be willing and, and more receptive to striking those business deals. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And what do you plan to do? Is there a data play? So as you're, you know, you have your own model, you're paying for all this data, you're generating a lot of data. Is there anything that you plan to do with the data that you generate? Um, is that, you know? Yes. And, and I think that is where, sorry, Austin, I think it cut you off. No, no, I just, I, I you kind of answer my question. Is that a product itself? You know, you're providing these insights, but then yeah. So, so, got it. so, yeah, I'm, got it. Well. so I'm looking at cast as twofold. One is a workflow app, which is launching, which is on the app store today, actually, but we're upgrading the commercial side of things where people can pay. So one is the workflow side, which has been extremely well received. I've run more than 50 demos and it's been unanimously positive. The other is the data side, which is where I think, um, the IP is going to be, and I'm already talking to a lawyer for maybe a provisional IP. It might be too early right now, but the idea is going to be having proprietary signals. So just like people buy stocks, you have 300, 400 indicators, uh, fundamental and technical. This is what I imagine every property to be in the country or every seller, potential seller and buyer. So proprietary AI signals that can basically give you a profile of when a person is going to be likely to become a buyer or seller. All right. Uh, are there more questions? Okay. So, uh, is uh, any of the sharks is interested to connect? Anyone in or you guys out? Uh, I'd like to connect. Perfect. Austin. Uh, Austin is willing to connect. One shark is in. Okay. Thank you. Congrats. What else? I'd be I'd be interested to uh, to follow along. Um, I think that it's super interesting, you know, coming, uh, you know, I grew up in Vancouver, BC, and there's, uh, you know, every second person, you know, is a realtor over there. So would like to get an idea of, uh, of what they think about it. And I, the, the use cases they might have. Perfect. Two shots. I had, a, I had a client in Cal, I had a client in Canada too, like top mm -hmm. producer and, and he's, he's pretty much sold on the idea, but he's also mm -hmm. using my services. Thank you, Matt. Okay. So three left, uh, class. I'm going to be out on this one, but then I've actually looked at a couple of companies and it's really difficult for me to see five years from now, which one's going to be the winner. There's lots of companies in lead generation, but uh, good luck. Um, thanks for the details. Perfect. Appreciate the feedback. Yeah. I'm going to be out on this one. Um, I think 
as a workflow app alone, like that's not enough. Like there's just so many solutions out there in real estate. And then like, I think in res respect to the lead generation side, like that is the more interesting part of this. But I, I think in order for those leads to be credible, this is going to have to be incredibly sophisticated behind the scenes. And, and, and you're going to need to raise something on the order of like $20 million to pull off the data integration exercise that's required because you're going to be pulling in data sources. This is a huge data mining federation and aggregation play where you might be able to take all that and synthesize like some good leads out of it. But I, I think there's no way to sort of like put your toe into this. Like maybe if you like start in like a specific geography, but I, I can just see the cost to, to train this model to be like very expensive and time consuming. So I think for that reason, I'm out. Thank you. May I really? Okay. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. And Caroline. Uh, yeah, I'm out for a variety of reasons, but to cut to the chase, it's around too early for me. Right. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. And uh, Vipin, thank you. Good luck. Uh, please share your GGW profile here. And we're moving on. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And the next presenter is uh, uh, Jashri Duta. Yeah, uh, hi. Hi. We, we don't hear you. I barely hear you. Can you? Yes. Yeah, Can so. you hear me all right now? It's better. Right now it's better. better? OK, OK. All right. Uh, you got Sorry. two minutes and you may start now. Okay, one second. Uh, yep, yeah. hello, yep. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm excited to talk about Atronis. Uh, Atronis is an AI powered product digitization platform uh, for transforming physical inventory to digital listings. A little bit of background about me. I've been in the tech industry for over 20 years. Uh, built customer service automation platform at Uber, tooling and automation at Robinhood, and data teams at Walmart. And I've gained a lot of unique insight about the retail and automation space. Um, now, I know that product digitization is a really big problem for retailers alone. To put that, product in, uh, that problem in perspective, Walmart spends $15 billion in product digitization year over year, and every retailer spends 1% to 2% of their revenue. And why is this a problem? Because the process is extremely error prone, manual, and involves coordination across multiple functions, including design, photography, merchandising, operations, and technology, to name a few. And this is where Atronis comes in. We offer an end-to-end -end automation pipeline. We capture photos, bulk process images, and automatically generate listings with merchant-specific configurations. We also seamlessly integrate with existing tooling in the enterprise and orchestrate the entire pipeline all the way end to end. We know this works. Our digitization platform, when applied to one of our customers, reduced the time to market by 98% and costs by 88%. And it increased their con conversions by 200,000 month over month through better quality listings. We have amazing traction ever since our product launch in January, we have three paying customers with 43K in ARR, and we are working on six pilots currently with 100K ARR. We are in active conversations with companies like Walmart, Gap, and Levi's. We hope to reach 500K in ARR by end of this year and 2.5 million by the end of 2025. We have a hand-picked team of experts with extensive engineering and product experience amassed from the top tech companies. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time. Dear Sharks. Let's hear what you got to say. Any questions? You know, Jayshree, so to compare to, one, you know, one of the experiences I've had is as a brand, you basically take your photographs and then you upload the pictures and send it over to the, the retailer, whether it's, let's say, Whole Foods or Walmart, and you send it to them and then they create the planogram from that, but they're basically using the pictures, which are photography provided by the brand and also the details provided by the brand. Uh, onto their system or onto the system which does the uh, uh, GS1 basically. So you can interconnect it to the GS1 between the brand and the retailer. So are, is this a B2C or is it a B2B? That's the first thing. And how, where do you create value? How do you create value in, for smaller brands or for Walmart? Yeah, so it is B2B. And we create uh, value for both the uh, resellers, the distributors, as well as the the retailers like for example walmart uh, as you described and how we create value is we um, help with uh, bulk automation so we connect to all of the retail uh, tools like the uh, the 
like DAMS and PIMS, product information managers, um, and we uh, and the MDMs, and we automatically um, uh, complete uh, the process, which takes uh, like a lot of manual intervention, uh, pulling in Excel spreadsheets from one system to another, uh, publishing data from one system to another. So we automatically orchestrate orchestrate that by connecting with all of these tools and create value. So for smaller brands, we have a full service platform through which we uh, not only like do bulk image processing, removing backgrounds, upscaling images, creating 3D um, images uh, or 3D renderings from uh, 2D images. And then we also help syndicate the content across multiple marketplaces. Who do you disrupt in the market? Is that the GS1s of the world you're competing against or who, who do you disrupt? So we uh, we add value across the entire supply chain. So uh, the what we are disrupting is this process exists end to end, but there is a lot of uh, manual effort involved. So uh, the the GS ones can uh, get the the benefit by um, like completing the process in let's say hours instead of months, and the retailers can uh, complete their processing again in hours instead of months and weeks and months. So we, our disruption, our value prop is reducing this entire time that it takes end to end, and of course costs. And so, um, I'm a bit confused, but I'll, I'll come back to it. I'll let somebody else go in first. So I just did a quick, so I, I put your website in and then I looked up AI inventory management. The first one that came up was C3.ai. They're, they're a public AI company um, and they have a, an inventory management very similar to yours. How would you say that you're different than someone like, you know, they're a pretty big player in the space. And how would you say that you're, what is your mode compared to them? How are you different? Yeah. So one thing is uh, there are uh, uh C3.ai, for example, is in, in inventory management. We are not specifically inventory management. What we are doing is this process of converting physical inventory to digital inventory. So we are not helping with the tracking, forecasting, et cetera. We are uh, enabling that process of converting physical to digital. And so that's a very unique space. And we are automating that entire space. And what our mode is that we have an entire pipeline automation with a network of models. And this, uh, it's uh, probably easy to copy one model, but not easy to copy an entire network of models to orchestrate that entire pipeline end to end. Okay. Okay. Probably one more question. We got a, uh, we have a, a lot of more hands to pitch today. So uh, is there any other question to ask uh, uh, before we continue? I think I'll go with why now. Like it's just efficiency. It, what has changed in the technology that makes it possible today and wasn't possible two years back? Sort of piggybacking on Austin's question as well, right? C three can also incorporate the same feature. Mm -hmm. Generative AI, uh, of course, is a big uh, differentiator now, and also the uh, advancements in computer vision technology. So uh, er, right now there are uh, vision technologies to create like advanced. Just they're just starting. The, there are Python libraries out there to just start creating like 3D images from uh, 3D objects uh, from uh, 2D images. Uh, so we want to cap uh, capture and capitalize on that momentum and uh, start now. Okay, so question to the sharks, who is interested to connect with uh, uh, Jayshree? Uh, who's in, who's out, any short feedback? Yeah, I'd love to connect. Awesome, our shark is in. Fantastic. Uh, who else? Two sharks like connect as well. And awesome. Two sharks are in. Uh, Austin, Dan. Yeah, I I think it's an interesting idea, but I'm gonna have to pass. I think uh, I I want to clearly more clearly understand the moat and and kind of what what makes you special from a lot of the the other or just different inventory managers in the space. Uh, but best of luck to you, and I'm, uh, I'm excited to see where you guys go. Thank you. One shark is out and uh, Matt then left. Matt? Yeah, similar to uh, what Austin said with the uh, percent space. Thank you. Okay, well, two out. Then? I'll be out on this one. Um, it just feels a little light on details and, and how this process of digitization exactly happens. And it, it does sound like there's a human in the loop, so I'm not 
sure I'm totally getting the value of what's happening here. Um, but uh, I also know as a fact, like there's a lot of competitors in this space. And I think uh, for me, they can kind of better articulate their differentiating factor. And so I think I would kind of work on that if I were you. Uh, and maybe even walk through a specific example of where your approach is superior to existing solutions. Sure. Thanks, Dave. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Share your information and we're moving on. The next uh, startup to present, uh, Larisse, Mark, Banuk. Uh, and uh, we have a little, we're a little bit behind time, so we maybe uh, increase the pace. So we have less questions or shorter questions if possible. Uh, but of course, uh, we'll see. Anyway, Mark. You've got two minutes, go for it. Hi, Sharks. I'm very excited to present you Lee Rise and our mission to unlock AI for 1 million companies. Now, every company wants to adopt AI, right? But it's really difficult. Take this FinTech startup in Silicon Valley was looking to adopt AI, but didn't know where to start. They were stuck. Talk to so many companies and it turns out over 80% of executives can not find the AI use cases to start with. It's also super expensive, costing $150,000 on average to make an AI talent hire. And it takes over three months to make that hire that's if you're lucky. Well, all these problems are of the past because we've developed the platform for companies who want to adopt AI quickly. It's super simple. Think about a chat GPT-like experience. So an LLM at companies can chat and it will revert to them when to start with AI what to build in terms of AI use case, why to build it by defining the AI ROI, and finally, the how, by matching them with a team built specially for, this, for, this, uh, for building this app for their use case. And they could, it, could, it can happen all just within two weeks and at half the cost. They pay a monthly subscription to get all of this through the platform. So we've been having really good traction. Over 50 companies signed up, 3,000 of the best caliber engineers, and we grew our sales by 5x and are on our way this year to triple it even more with amazing pre-seed investors like Techstars powered by JP Morgan. This is a huge market. We're looking at half a, half a trillion dollar market with 38 million jobs today. Our plan is to capture just 3,000 jobs on this platform at an average pay of um, $35,000 that would generate over $100 million in ARR. And we have the best co-founding team to get us there because we've co-founded and built AI data companies before and scaled marketplaces to over a million users. So we're now preparing our seed round to uh, increase our engineering team and our product development and our go-to market channels by investing in them to grow to a million users and be the market leader in AI adoption. Thank you, uh, dear Sharks. What's your questions? Um, what's your what's your raise in, in value? So Let's we're see. now uh, are, um, we're raising uh, a first close of a million dollars. We also secured a half a million dollar grant, an impact grant to hire, especially focused on women uh, in Africa. So and we have uh, you know soft commitments of around a million dollars, and currently also. Uh, proposal like a more harder commitment of 100k so that's uh, currently the the round dynamics okay and then um second thing so do you own the model that you're using to to uh to train and then what are you using to train uh the model as well yeah so yeah we 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 own the model we we what we train the model on is previous use cases and proposal we've done for customers and proven roi we also have data sources um, that we um, expand the training on. I'm happy to go in the secret sauce and more of uh, the, the product uh, uh, roadmap uh, also later in a call, but yeah. Okay. Awesome, maybe one more question and uh, uh, I, yeah. Yeah, I would just uh, kind of seek clarification on what the product is exactly. It's a little too non-specific for me. Um, so you're kind of saying you're helping organizations to like envision how they can use AI, but then there, you're kind of indicating like there's a marketplace and like you're capturing jobs of some kind. So are, are you like a recruiting platform? Are you like helping source people? Yes, so that's the last. Yes, that's a part of, of the models where marketplace where we have the AI talents from Africa uh, that are vetted, be vetted. But what we do is we, through our LLM, to think about like ChatGPT for businesses,
companies would log in and it will tell them what use cases to build for their business, uh, why to build it. So it, you can upload your data and it will calculate your ROI. So for example, tell you, you would, invest, you would invest $100,000. I'll give you a use case, a case study. There's this legal firm in New York that actually does DD, but they do their reports on DD for hiring and m and uh, manually. So they spend 10,000 hours a year um, costing them half a million dollars around to write these reports manually. So they input this data basically in the model and it will feedback saying, hey, you can save half a million dollars this year by building this automated uh, AI LLM for your, your, your business. And by having a team of these five engineers build it for the next uh, seven months and then continue uh, maintain, maintaining it. So that's how we monetize and that's a use case here um, Thank show you. you how this product is used. Austin, you have a short question. Just real quickly, do you so once you're once a company uses your platform to find the best AI solution or the, or the recruiting scenario and they, they found it, what's to stop them from saying, hey, we're we're done, you helped us? And so I use the term ARR, but how do you how do you continuously capture value over time um after you provide a solution? It seems like a one and done uh, in from one sense. Yeah, so um, it's very difficult. The stickiness here is for them to work with these engineers through the, inf the platform. So it's very hard to, um, to work remotely with AI engineers. Uh, there are data security implications to sharing data um, and also managing this remote work. So the way we do it is we, we provide the infrastructure for work so they could subscribe and work with these engineers across the, the duration uh, of, of, the, of the project and then continuing working uh, after they've developed it uh, through the platform. So this is kind of where the stickiness is. We have annual contracts of around uh, a year that are automated and they can unsubscribe two months um, um, in advance, but we see stickiness and customers continuing to use and work with the engineers after. Got it, thank you. So Sharks, any, uh, anyone wants to connect with Mark? Anyone in or you guys out? Um, I, I'll, I'll connect to them. Perfect. Avant Shark is in. Congratulations. What about the rest of you guys? I think I'll, I'll have to pass on this one, um, just because it sounds a little too much like a, uh, more of a consulting company, uh, mm -hmm. than it does more of anything in itself. Um, best of luck though. Thank you. Carolyn, Dan, Haas. No, I'm going to pass. Thanks. Pass. Thank you. Dan. I'm going to be out. Uh, I just find uh, your your pitch is like a little too non-specific and kind of unfocused for me. It's like recruiting and uh, project management, and then this general LLM. And I don't exactly understand what you're doing, and I don't necessarily see how the piece that you just described is any different than prompting an LLM really well. So unless there's this tremendous intermediary layer where you're adding a lot of value and doing something that I just can't do in say chat GPT or Claude, um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm like fully understanding your vision. Um, I would personally recommend restricting this to a, like a very narrow niche just to prove out like for a specific use case, sector, vertical, uh, like how it would work and then expand from there. It's just a bit too broad for me right now. So I'm out. Thank you. Awesome. And Haas? Me second, Dan. I'll be out as well. Good luck, Mark. All right, Mark, you got your feedback. Show you did you double profile and we'll connect you with Austin afterwards next day. Thank you. And we are taking the final project for today. Uh, it's Ali Razengi Ra 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 from Emo AI. Ali, you ready? Yes, thank you very much. We, Tim, uh, I maybe a little bit, microphone a little bit closer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Got two minutes. Thank you all. I'm Ali, founder of Immutable Labs. We're here to discuss the benefits of the distributed systems um, and processing that our patent allows us to do, which makes us very competitive for AI solutions and other very computing heavy workload solutions. The product that we have is a SaaS service that gives you full compliance and explainability for your AI data models from the ground up. It has a major climate impact because our green proof of work framework allows us to send your workloads to distributed computers that are currently in low energy density uh, zones so that they're able to give that excess energy to us and have it be carbon neutral. 
It also helps a lot with explainable AI because as the data models are being built from the ground up, it's all done with explainability built into the platform. And finally, because of all the energy our system saves, we're able to provide much better hallucination protection and support by allowing this to run on other LLMs and then sharing the results with the end users based on the end users feedback using real human feedback, we're able to train other data models to become even more efficient at it. So these are the main things that our service provides. This is a web three platform. And therefore what we were able to do was to build out a new proof of work um, protocol that will power all of these things and allow us to give these benefits to the regular world and the regular Web2 world. Are there any questions about the particular product or how it works or how the SaaS product works? Yeah, can you walk us through how it works exactly? Sure. Essentially what we have is we took the proof of work framework, which Ethereum and Bitcoin have that allow you to fully validate and audit everything that happened, but using that for that AI data models. Our bias detection algorithms will run first. This is all on immutable storage, so it can never be changed. The results are there and it meets all the GDPR requirements for bias detection. We then also do the sensitive data detection so you know that data is safe. The data is saved somewhere else where your team can review it later to see what this was trained on. So if they need to go back, they can say, hey, this is what this was trained on. It also allows you to be GDPR compliant. So when a requesting an end user says, did you ever train this using my data, which is one of the requirements of explainability and GDPR, you can easily and authoritatively say this was it with the same level of trust blockchain supports. Those are some of the main features we provide on that. So this is sort of like a SOX compliancy layer for, layer for like AI models is kind of what I'm hearing here. Um, it, it's interesting, do you, like, can you point to, like, are you live? Do you have customers? Can you point to some success use cases? Great questions. Thank you so much. We are not live yet. We are launching our test net in a couple of weeks. So if anybody is interested in seeing that, please message me. I'll get you access to it and I'll give you a private demo. We do not have customers yet, but I do have several that are high profile that I am talking to and have interest in. I don't want to say their name live here. So if you'd like, I'll be happy to disclose that to you privately and we can talk to them as well if needed. But it's also for explainability. Disclosure of how it was trained on and SOX compliant is one part of it, but being able to explain how did you get to that answer while having access to the underlying data um, is very powerful. So it's those two features that we hit very hard. On the green side of things, we're green because our machine lets you pick what vendor you want to go to. But we can also say these ones, Akash, CoreWeave, or these other people, by using green proof of work on top of it, we can actually trust the GPS coordinates and ensure that it's green workloads being sent so that if you're reaching the limits of your carbon credits and such, you can move the workloads there. All right. Thank you so much. We got to wrap this up. We have very little time left. Uh, so the final, sh uh, final selections of the sharks. Anyone interested to connect with this startup with Ali? Are you guys in or out? I'm going to be out on this one. Thank you, Ali. Thanks, you. Austin, Austin. Out as well. Best of luck, Al. Okay, out. Uh, Austin, I didn't, I didn't get your answer. Out. I'd, I'd like to connect to them. Oh, perfect. One shark is in. Okay, Dan. I'm going to be out on this one. Um, you just got a, a lot to prove out, but uh, like, I'll definitely like connect with you on LinkedIn and follow your progress. And uh, good luck awesome. with your pilots and customers. Yeah, Caroline. Yeah, I'm I'm with Austin. I'm in. I'm I'm curious. There's a lot going on, but I'd like to learn some more. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, Ali, great job. Share your GW profile, everyone. Uh, this is the moment we are closing our session. So I'm putting myself back in. Uh, super excited. So we're about to uh, finish uh, the session, and this is the moment when uh, our sharks will share their opinion. So it was fantastic. That's 46 event with Tech Week, New York Tech Week, and uh, we are closing this New York Tech Week uh, this Friday. It's, uh, that's fantastic. So share your information, connect, support each other. And of course, give some shout out uh, on social media about this event. Take screenshots, tag Go Go World, New York, that we can ask, and of course, the Sharks. So, dear Sharks, uh, let's close this. Share your uh, 
what do you got on your hearts and minds and uh, yeah let's close the session then let's start with you what do you what do you have to say to the uh, to, to the audience to the rest of the world and yeah well got a great job and thank you to all the entrepreneurs that pitched today I thought there were some really interesting companies um, I think my like if I was gonna have some generic pitch feedback um, I would just say that given like a really compressed time frame and since we don't have the benefit of like seeing a deck or having these visualizations, that one piece of advice would be to walk through like a really quick example of like how your product would be used in the real world, um, kind of an adopted a persona and say like, this is the kind of company that would need my product. This is how they would use it. And this is the resulting value that would come from using it. Other than that, like it becomes a little bit hard to sort of visualize and conceptualize what it is your company does. So, so that would be my piece of advice. And awesome. thank you for everyone for pitching, it was great. It's always great to have you, Dan. Thank you for your very good advice. Caroline, you go next. Yeah, happy to, and want to be mindful of time here. I'll kind of extend from Dan and say, pitching, whether it's two minutes or 20 minutes, is all about storytelling. And so I think he gave some tactical advice to that to draw us in and, and want us to learn more. You're here to get a second call, not necessarily get our money on this call. And then the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, take all of this advice with a grain of salt. You're the operators in your companies and you know better than we do. So thank you for allowing us to be part of the journey and keep going, build resiliency, and let me know if I can be helpful. Fantastic. Thank you so much for participating in your advice and uh, yeah, sharing these words. Austin, go next. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone for being here. I'm going to tag on um, uh, Caroline's a little bit and say just you know, keep moving forward. Um, we're, we're a group of five smart individuals, but you know, the world is your oyster. And like you said, you know your business better than all of us do. And so, um, you know, take take the information with a grain of salt and, and, and best of luck to, to everyone moving forward. Thank you, Austin. It was fantastic having you and uh, appreciate your advice and feedback. Matt, your turn. Yeah, pitches, pitches are great. I think uh, Pippin did a good job of adopting that user persona. You, I, I believe he used the name John. So he said, John does this, John does that. So that really allowed me to paint a picture in my head of who the uh, target customer is and what he might be doing and how he's going to get value. So I think that's a, take that piece of advice and kind of incorporate it into your future pitches. But overall, thank you everybody. And for the founders who didn't get to pitch, um, you know, I'm sure we're going to cross paths soon. And, you know, I'm sure everybody's got the LinkedIn messages rolling in already. So looking forward to, uh, to reading those. Thank you for your participation and thank you for the uh, support of entrepreneurs. Uh, and for the sports, of course. Um, Haas, you're closing our global session, uh, New York Tech Week uh, as well. So say say whatever you have on your hearts and minds uh, to, to all of us. No, I'll, I'll agree with what everyone else has actually spoken of. And what I'll do is I'll just give maybe five points for two minutes. Is that, you know, when you have a two minute pitch, just start with what is the problem? What is the solution? Why is your solution better than everyone else's? Why is your team the perfect team to do this and what's the long-term sustainable advantage and maybe overall market size as well because that's pretty important for me but if you can just hit these four or five points everything else can flow from there all right and that was ggw sharks for uh, 46 at new york tech week as with support of anderson horowitz amazing shark panel of sharks from across the world and silicon valley austin uh, Canada and uh, 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 and other places and amazing panel of uh, entrepreneurs who are pitching today and we will give more opportunities to pitch in the future meet on Google world platform create your profiles of startups investors and advisors and the system will ma uh, manage to connect you to the most relevant ones so it Take advantage of this, support each other, give us your feedback. I just shared uh, here the link and uh, spread the word about Google World and uh, keep supporting us and each other. Thank you, everyone. Have a great the rest of the week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank Daniel. You, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you.